And now our next talk, uh, we will have Marco Weinen. He is, uh, is Dutch. He has been contributing to WordPress since 2010. And in the last few years, he has been traveling the world and talking about uh, develop, uh, developing and de deployment in, in WordPress. So we will hear how to master WordPress deployment and embracing continuous deployment practices. And probably we will change the way we deploy our, our websites. So let's enjoy the talk. Thanks, Marco. Thank you. And, and let's see if his words are coming through. <laughs> so a little bit about me, what he said. I'm from Netherlands. I'm a senior software engineer at GEMF, where we manage Apple devices for education and businesses. I also have my own company called Code Kitchen, where I do some WordPress stuff and other related projects. I contributed back to 24 versions of WordPress, and I have been a lead uh, developer of WordPress from 2013 till 15, which is basically translate of WordPress.org. So the story of today is generally when you work on your website and you deploy it, you're going to use FTP, you upload the files. There can be everything, it can be just the changes depending on how good you are, but generally what people do is like copy paste the folder, upload it online, and then maybe you need to do some manual steps depending on what, how you host it. So the agenda of today is I'm going to introduce a little bit what continuous integration is, what the challenges are, what the benefits are, how I host my own website, and some of the way you can implement it. So continuous integration is the, the better development practices on how you can run your code. So continuous integration means you build it in a pipeline automatically, you do some testing, test if the code works. And and when if you, if based on whatever criteria you define, it can be unit test only, it can be integration test, it can be whatever you want. The deployment is basically the next step. You don't have to do it, you can do it still manually, but at least with continuous integration, you know the code is fine. But deployment is, means you have a deployment step. So afterwards, it automatically deploys to a sandbox environment, staging, production, the way, depending on the client and how you set it up. A small picture is here, you can see uh, you, you have your code, you're committed, it goes to a build step, unit test integration, and then you have like a review stage and production. So what can happen? You automatically deploy it, for example, to a staging environment, the tester can test it out, you can test it out, and then there can be a manual approval within your pipeline that you say like, I approve this, and it automatically deploys to production as well. Uh, it prevents a lot of hassle. If your internet connection is poor, you don't care because a, a different system with good internet connection can do all the deployments for you. Some of the objectives are streamlined de development. So as a developer, you just want to create code without thinking about deployment because all that stuff is done in code. Um, you have early detection of bugs. So we have we had presentation before where we show everything uh, about that stuff. And it, when you do a lot of unit testing, you can report it back and you know what is going wrong. You have a faster time to market because as a developer, you only care about the code. So when you deploy it, it automatically does it. You don't need to do it manually anymore. And if you do a lot of deployments every day or every week, that time has been saved to actually build new feature functionality. And because of this, everything is done in code. It's reliable because there's not that you forget a step to do because you want to release something really fast and suddenly you forget to change the configuration. Everything is done in that pipeline. And then there's the, with WordPress, what I said before with FTP, what are the challenges with that? So you have a lot of manual updates. So the plugins, the teams, you have to do that within WordPress and you need to log in. So there's also things to forget. Security is then an aspect as well. You can basically check if everything is up to date within the pipeline when you build it. There's generally lack of version control because people have their project running locally on the machine, no version control. They have no clue if something breaks where it's broken. There's no way like within Git that you can say like, oh yeah, I want to go back 10 commits. Does it still work? And if it if it's works, you can go back only five and find out which commit actually broke. Then there's a the scalability issue. So generally, okay, most websites are fine to have them running on the shared hosting, but say that you need to go scaling with multiple servers. Uploading files, I've done it. It's not ideal. It's a, it's, it becomes way more cumbersome. Again, the security vulnerabilities, is so it's not only the plugins, 
but there's also the risk of all the software that you run as well. And what you normally see, limited testing environments. So there's a lot of hosting that do provide staging environments, but it's generally a copy-paste step that you need to perform yourself. It doesn't always work as well as you maybe want that to work. So the benefits are basically all the stuff that is broken, but then you try to fix it, right? So you basically try to accelerate the development. You try to make it as fast as possible, not because you want to have it as fast, but generally you don't care about the de deployment. If there's an automatically system that you trust, and especially you trust because the code is getting unit tests correctly, you have a decent amount of unit tests, so it's not like, yeah, you have a few tests, but in the end the code coverage is 10 percent. You want it to be 80, 90 or higher, so that when you deploy it, you know you can trust it, especially with integration tests that you know if something is broken that WordPress is not loading, you know it's not loading. It's increased collaboration, even though you might work more in silos, but it's not like you want something to go to the tester. The tester can do it online. They don't need to do it offline on their machine. Maybe some concurrency is missing. That, and that this way, it, the, all the collaboration you do is meaningful. It adds to the product. Because of the automated testing, you have enhanced quality, and that's also really important to have, and continuously feedback. Um, if you do the code changes, you can do also like automatically testing if the code is correct uh, by Sonar Cube or some that checks the code. So if there's an undefined variable, but you don't have a unit test, those stuff like systems like Sonar Cube will say the code is having an undefined variable, and generally those warnings are pretty accurate. So a little bit about my hosting setup. I use Kubernetes. So for I guess most are there some people that know Kubernetes here? Oh, there's quite a few. It adds complexity, but it's also really cool. So Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration platform. So what it does is it allow it does it already has a lot of cool tool sets around it. It automatic aut automates your deployment, scaling and the management of your application by creating a lot of configuration files by in general. And it allows to declarative do that. So they have different types of objects that you can put in. So for example, your Nginx configuration, like the host and where the pod goes, and you can deploy it in code. So the staging environment would be the same as your production. If it, you basically can destroy ev all, everything and rebuild it again without any hassles. Uh, so that is something how it looks like. So basically, you have a master node. You don't need to care about that. That's generally what the hosting is providing you. And it's basically the API server. You talk to that, like, I want this uh, uh, deployment to be on that machine. And then you have multiple servers. So they, in Kubernetes, it's called a node, but it's basically a VPS. And it has some a lot of things are running. And especially for us, the most important one is the container runtime. That's basically your Docker. So everything you deploy is a Docker image. So you can run it locally, normally, as a Docker image, but when you deploy it, it runs on a Kubernetes cluster with a lot of scaling. Again, you don't need, really need to know this because in the end, if you want to do Kubernetes, it's a lot of difficult work maybe, but it also gives you understanding on what it can be and what power Kubernetes in the end gives. So a little bit about the, uh, the common objects. So you have a namespace. So in Kubernetes, you have basically siloed clusters, virtual clusters where everything runs, and one namespace cannot communicate with another namespace unless you want to. You have a pod, so a pod is basically a deployment, and, and a pod can c contain a build multiple Docker images. So what I normally do is I create a pod, or basically deployment with pods, where I separate PHP with, from Nginx. So they have their own little thing what they deliver, and it, what a deployment does is basically the life cycle. If I want to have one pod, Multiple pods, depending on how much traffic I get, I, get, I can do that. Uh, I got my ingress. So ingress is basically what, what is Nginx. So there I can define marcoheine.com needs to go to this application, and it will do all the traffic for you. It will also create a load balancer on, from, uh, on the, the host itself. So you don't need to care about that. You have your config map and secrets. And that's basically your, your configuration, like maybe your database password, uh, maybe the hash of WordPress that you have stored it there, especially with configuration in, if you have a diversity control, you don't put your password there. So you want to have a, a secure place where you can store it. And there's also tools around it in the way you protect your secret in Kubernetes. And then you have your jobs and cron jobs. So within Kubernetes, you can do a one-time thing, that's a job, or you have a cron job that creates continuously jobs and you run it every minute, every five minutes. So you can move your WordPress cron job to this, 
So WordPress doesn't need to care anymore. The user doesn't notice, and you can run it every five minutes, even if there's no traffic at all. Then you have Helm, and that's basically a way to create your YAML files with additional configurations. So generally, your configuration is not the same for production and staging. There are different domains. Maybe on staging, you only want to run one server, but on production, you need eight because you have that much traffic. So you can make those little differences within Helm pretty easily. And it promotes reusability. So within Helm, you also have functions. So reusable classes, like maybe your labels, you can easily define it in a function and reuse it everywhere in your code. And what the story is about today, it's really facilitate continuous deep delivery because everything is done in code. You don't need to care about it. You basically can destroy the whole Kubernetes cluster. You can easily move from AWS to DigitalOcean and back without that much hassle, at least from an application level. And, and it, it creates enhanced consistency because it's continuously uh, try to do the same stuff over again. So on staging, it's the same as production. On Sandbox, it doesn't matter if it's on Amazon, it doesn't matter which host you are, you know when you, uh, if you deliver it, it will be the same no matter which host it is. I also run additional applications on it, so Kubernetes does support a lot of the configuration stuff, but say Ingress doesn't work out of the box itself. It needs to have a controller. I use the one from nginx.org. Not, it's not the default one, but it allows a little bit more customization than I want. I would not recommend it to most people because I do have issues with it, but challenges is always good. You learn from it and it makes you a better developer engineer or depending on what your needs are. I use a cert manager. So I, in my ingress, I can just define markaheine.com also have a TLS certificate and it automatically generates. I don't need to go in command line saying like to, uh, to uh, let's encrypt yeah, create a certificate here, and then I need to put it in Nginx. So a lot of the troubles are gone for me. And if I want to create more or like a wildcard, yes. Especially the wildcard, I still need to do the DNS stuff, but even if it's on the same host, it can do it automatically for you. You don't need to care about the DNS records anymore. Kubernetes does it. So while the start phase can be troublesome, it does add a lot of ease later on. Uh, I also run Tumbar. So it's a separate image manipulation server in Python. So I know that all the images I serve are WebP. Uh, if the, I want to support something else, it also does face detection, object detection. Uh, so now WordPress does support WebP, but I'm running this server for probably five, six years. So my images are always nice. They were as small as possible, or not as possible, but small enough. They always are a little bit, probably better optimizations, but out of the box. You don't want to care about it, so it does work really well. And I have a logging operator. So what happens with Kubernetes is if the pod is gone, your log files are gone. And the logging operator is basically saying, like, those logs from those deployments, I want to store it in S3. I want to store it in a system that handles the log files. It works really well, and it's really awesome to have it around. And then even five, like, depending on what your criteria are set, you can get it removed uh, two months later later, a year later, depending on how critical those logs from that applications are. Again, everything is in code, so you don't need to go in a server, try to configure it somewhere in some path on the server, which you probably forgot about it a month later. Um, so a little bit more specific on how I run my own site on the server is uh, I run it on DigitalOcean, obviously Kubernetes. I use GitLab uh, because there was before GitHub was free for everyone that you can also have private projects. I use GitLab CI CD. And probably even if I would choose, I would maybe still use GitLab because I still think GitLab is a pretty cool product. Uh, my storage is on digital ocean spaces because while Kubernetes on digital ocean is really awesome, there's one feature lacking. You cannot have storage to multiple different uh, pods. So it can only be one pod or at least on one server. It cannot be on multiple servers. Uh, AWS has that, but in general, you don't need to because if you move it to this ocean spaces, you also get a free CDN for that storage. So why not use it? Uh, I used it as this through Alpine 319, uh, my web service Nginx, so PHP, some default stuff. Try to be always up to date. And I also use Elasticsearch, but it's not in Kubernetes because I rather have that on a separate VPS because it's just a little bit easier. And what I said with the storage, if it would need to restart, especially when the storage is on a shared storage system. 
it's really sometimes troublesome to get it restarted again. Uh, some basic about the deployment is in your deployment, you can also have init containers. Those generally have a little bit more permissions. So what I do there is I copy paste my assets from WordPress to uh, Nginx as well. So all the assets of WordPress itself are hosted that way. So it's a little bit faster. And it does some Linux configurations, um, which you normally should not be able to do in a container. And what I said before, I run an Nginx and a PHP container. So the PHP container is my deployment. The Nginx is just Docker image available there where I put some configuration to. And that is what I also have in my config. My secrets are uh, my database certificate. Uh, I have my password there and my uh, DigitalOcean space, uh, space API credentials. I have my ingress setup with my TLS. I have my cron job. I run it every five minutes, and I believe that's more than enough. I, there's no really need to run it every one minute. And that cron job basically stores the log files from the last three runs. So if there would be something wrong with my code, I can look into it and see what the log files were. And I have Tumbar uh, running there as well. I moved it from my own personal size to a specific subdirectory. So I don't need to do the additional DNS lockup, but that's a pro process that I'm currently working on. And the question is, why do I set up it the way it is? Um, as you can imagine, the cost is about $70, $80 a month, way overkill for my simple website. But it's also a learning experience, right? You want to become better or you want to play with new stuff. Uh, I have stuff running on Node.js there on a little droplet and everything is separated. So what we learned today with security as well, if one website is getting hacked, I'm pretty sure the rest of the stuff is not getting hacked because I have certain security in place. Um, so if, and even that, if they would change my WordPress files, not a problem. I kill the bot, everything is clean again. Um, if they upload the PHP file to my uploads directory, it's in digital ocean spaces, so PHP cannot run. So it's, it, for me, it's maybe a lot of hassle, it's maybe a little bit expensive, but I also like to play with new technology and I'm able to do this because generally there are Docker images for it. There are Helm charts to deploy Redis, Elasticsearch, like the new cool tech, and I can just run it, play with it for a week, and I'm fine. If I want to show a customer something like a WordPress site with some stuff on it, maybe some custom code, I can deploy it, I can destroy it a week later. If they want to play it again, it's a simple deployment and without the hassle because everything is with, done within code. Would I recommend it to anyone else? Maybe not, but for me it works. And then a little bit about how I implement continuously uh, the deployment of my own website. So obviously, but, but also in general. So what is important is that you select the right CI tool. That can be Jenkins, it can be GitLab, it can be GitHub Action, it can be any tool out there. If you want to use FTP, there are really cool websites that allows you to deploy with FTP. They will see if they can use rsync, for example, and find ways to only upload the things there. So if, for example, if you're a freelancer, travel around the world, you're at a location with poor internet, you can still commit that 10 kilobytes change and let that system deal with it because it will do it automatically for you. And you can just enjoy the weather, the holiday, or whatever you do during your travel. Um, and then also, which method you want to select. So it's FTP, SSA, RC, and Kubernetes Docker. Generally, it depends on your CI tool as well. And then how you want to do it. Like, obviously, I talk about uploading by FTP called the Big Bang. Just upload it here, see what it is. You also have blue-green, which means you do a new deployment to a new folder. And when you're done and did, for example, compose or update, it will switch it over. And then you have like canary rolling deployments. It's like, Basically, it will maybe destroy two of your four servers, build it up, and when it's four again, it will destroy the, older, the two other older ones. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do that. And you, about the rollback strategy. So even when you have everything in place, you can still have some issues, right? So with Helm, there's easily doing Helm rollback because if I need to run the whole CI pipeline, it can take five minutes, it can take 30 minutes, you don't know. Do you want to wait that the customers have a broken website for 30 minutes? No. With Helm, there's a rollback, and it, I believe it's 10 different chains, but you can configure that. So you can still roll back even further than that. So a little bit about GitLab CI CD, some code examples here. So how I do it is in three steps my website. I have a build step where I do a composer update and I store it in an artifact and as in a cache. So I know that it's there for the next step. The next step is my package step. So I have, that's the two steps running async. One is creating the Docker image. 
and it puts it in the repository in two different ways. So one is based on the brand's name, the other one on the, the commit uh, SSAs, because that one you want to use. Because Kubernetes, basically you want to able that Kubernetes can cache that file. If, it's, if you don't branch name, it cannot do it anymore. So you want to have to have it be as fast as possible uh, when you need to scale up, for example. And the Helm chart is pretty straightforward. It's just making sure that the configuration is in the right place and ready to go for your deployment. And then I have a deployment step. So the, the left side is basically a function you can reuse. And on the right side, I have, I say only a master deploy to production. There's like a, my Kubernetes namespace and what I call my environment, and you can also give it a name. So if I want to add staging, it's simply copy pasting the right side, change some variables, and I'm ready to go. Maybe not as fancy yet. So I show you an example of what I do at Jamf. We host it at AWS. It's on Kubernetes. First control is now different, it's Bitbucket. We use Jenkins. I like recently I had to change my distro because there was an issue. It was just a couple of minutes time. I can change my distro to from Alpine to Debian, Debian, and then I can also make sure that the package system is in place. So within an hour, I had a Docker image that was up and running again. Try to do that on a VPS. You are not going to enjoy yourself. Uh, obviously the database is different, but now we also included unit testing with PHP unit and we store the coverage. Our integration test is done by Cypress. So we do test the actually website and with HTML pressing buttons checking if the feedback is there. Uh, code analysis is done by Sonocube, so we know how good the code quality is. Generally, it also shows like things like, oh yeah, this line is 150 ca characters long, but you're only allowed to do 120. If it's old code, ignore it. If it's new code, you probably want, maybe want to look at it. And as we also do dependency tracking, and we do that with dependency track, so we know if there are security issues there. And we can even block the pipeline that they need to be f fixed first, before you do your deployment. Um, that is the settings what we do in Helm. It's a lot. <laughs> so we have some generally application set up. We also have um, a shared disk space where we cache some files. Um, it's cheaper than for Redis, for example, even though Redis can be faster. We don't mind. This is for us the best tool to use. We also define some PSP variables here for up caching, so the files are Put in memory, we don't need to care, some database information, the repositories, and basically for PHP and for Nginx, we all can also define what the limits are and the request. So we know what it is and how we can scale it. And then we can also do a lot of cool other stuff. And we also do some security stuff here. So the first part or basically says, it's a read-only system. If you log in, because with Kubernetes, you can still log in into the pod, but basically you're a read-only user. You cannot change anything of your application and that's basically what you want. You can still run a PHP script, for example, or use WP Slide to integrate with the database, but you're not allowed to change then the code. And, but most important part, we also have auto scaling. So this is the default value, so apparently no auto scaling at all. That's fine for a sandbox environment or the default environment, but we can override it. And this is basically how our auto scaling configuration looks like. So we have some, uh, the left side is how we scale down, that only goes by one pod, and we also have by two pods where we scale up. So we want to get rapidly speeding up when it's needed. So maybe one pod is a bit slower than the other one to scale up, so we want to be sure that we have two, and later on it can always scale down, right? We, we just want to be as fast as possible. And then we look at the metrics. So we only care about CPU for our PSP application, but for some application maybe you care more about memory. And then we would just define, like if it's 80%, then you're allowed to scale up with two pods. This is basically the step in our pipeline. Here we override all different kinds of variables. So we set our database passwords because we store all those secrets in Jenkins. And the most fun one is basically the ingress host. So what we do at our job, every sandbox deployment is on a different URL. So we can, if we make a new tweak, we can have a URL, the tester can use it, product can see it, they can approve it, and directly it can go live. So basically when you, I make a code change, I get deployed. Basically if my colleagues are fine, we can release it as soon as possible. And there's some other application setup as well and auto scaling. So we can say like on production, we want to start with four and we want maximum eight, um, but that value can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, recap, I sh shared a lot of information. You don't need to do a lot with it. 
depending on what you want, but I would just want to share my story, how I run it for my WordPress site, which was really simple, but also how I run it professionally at a company where we have to deal with 50 million requests a month. And then you want more out of Kubernetes, and Kubernetes gives it to you pretty straightforward. It's just giving some insight about that FTP works for most customers, I'm not complaining about it, but it is also like maybe something else. So maybe some customers want a little bit more attention or, and it gives you a tools like with FTP, you can do it with a website. That's already a huge improvement and those sites sometimes also deliver some CI, CD capabilities. Uh, thank you for listening. My name is Mark Heine. Well, thank you, Mark. It was a, a great talk. We only have, it, have time for one question, so if someone wants to make a question. If so? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, so, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, very good to explain it about the Kubernetes ecosystem, that, that's how it works. Uh, just a question for you. Over the last two years, is there any break change on the WordPress? Just because the last time I tried to, to run WordPress in Kubernetes, uh, mainly the, the admin area, the back office, was really, really slow. And uh, the, the problem that I found is that because of PHP works with a lot of reads in the disk and in Kubernetes, the, the read speed is slow, so the website will be slow. So for you, the uh, regarding the performance and uh, the admin experience, uh, editing content and editing configurations, what, uh, what is... Yeah, I guess it also depends on the host, right? So I have an experience that with DigitalOcean, but it, another host can be different. Um, I, what I said, I run 50 million, I run a lot of PSP applications as well that were high traffic. It's not something I experienced, uh, but... Yes, it can happen, obviously. It also depends on your application. If it does a lot of writes, yes, it can hurt, but it shouldn't matter if it's a VPS or Kubernetes. Because generally, there are not the same restrictions, but maybe with Kubernetes, you're more eager to deploy the applications, the same application multiple times on the same VPS, which could hurt it. You have some affini affinity rules so that you're, you can say, I want to, if you have multiple uh, nodes, that you can share that application better over all the nodes instead of that it will end up in the same node. But Yes, it will be a struggle, but that's that can be the file system. If it's not on the v, on VPS itself, but that file system is suddenly a shared system by NFS or whatever, yes, that can hurt it as well because generally that is also what happens. You're welcome. Thanks a lot, Marco. We are just uh, on time. Uh, I would like to, I've seen that more people have raised the end, but I'm sure that you will be available to talk with, with them outside. Okay. Yes. So. Thanks a lot, Marco, and let's get ready for the next next presentation.